to this computer. Excuse me for that. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to today's data science webinar organized by NCASA, the North Carolina chapter of the American Statistical Association. Thank you for attending. I'm Amy Shi, president of NCASA for this year. And here we have Susan Simmons with us too, who is the vice president of NCASA. NCASA is an active an ASA chapter uh, with diverse members. We offer professional development training, mentoring opportunities, webinars, and social events, such as career fair, recycled poster sessions, um, monthly socials um, across the state. This year's career fair will be held virtually on September the 2nd. So please check out our website to find out ways for you to get involved. Today, we are very excited to have Dr. Ming Li uh, to be here with us. Dr. Ming Li is a senior research scientist uh, at Amazon. He organized and presented a 2018 JSM in introductory overview lecture titled Leading Data Science, Talent, Strategy, and Impact. He was the chair of the quality and the productivity section of ASA. He obtained his PhD degree in statistics from Iowa State University in 2010. With deep statistics background and many years experience in data science and machine learning, he has trained numerous junior data scientists with different backgrounds, such as statisticians, software developers, database administrators, and business analysts. He is also an instructor of uh, Amazon's Internal Machine Learning University and adjunct instructor of University of Washington. Again, thank you for attending. During the talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the group chat. If it's something that needs to be addressed uh, immediately, I'll read it to Ming. Otherwise, Ming will answer those questions during our Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ming. Ming, thank you. Thanks, Amy, for the introduction, and thanks for uh, inviting me for uh, the other uh, opportunity to share my ideas and um, uh, hopefully uh, 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 for statisticians, I think is primary uh, the primary audience uh, for the chapter for this presentation. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to share my own experience uh, as a statistician, but uh, with um, uh, uh, data science and uh, machine learning uh, applications in mind. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. So uh, today, uh, within this one hour and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, topics that I actually not covered uh, um, regularly in uh, um, presentations or conferences. Uh, those are uh, project cycle, uh, career paths, soft skills, and the pitfalls uh, in data science. So first, I'd like to briefly um, uh, talk about the difference between a statistician and data scientist. So um, I think everybody had their own idea what is the difference between science and the engineering. Uh, but uh, the common uh, understanding is science is more fundamental and engineering is uh, more towards um, applications to solve a specific problem. And for example, uh, we do have the physics department uh, in the um, uh, a university, 
and the electrical engineering. So for physics department, uh, people study the very fundamental ideas of how uh, electrons interact with each other and electrons interact with other uh, matters. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, people studying physics usually do not focus on to invent a light bulb or a, um, a computer or an iPhone. But on the other hand, electrical engineering uh, department, uh, people are utilize the fundamental ideas uh, but uh, ways the complicated interaction with uh, electrons and other materials and people can create um, um, a more applied um, uh, solutions for day-to-day -day work. In statistics, um, most people is going to consider statistics as a branch of science. Uh, because most of the statistics department is part of the um, School of Science. Um, but there are some exceptions. Some uh, universities have statistics in the business school as well as at engineering schools. Um, but majority of the statistics department is part of the science, uh, the School of Science, and sometimes it's part of the math department. Uh, do we have a department called statistical engineering. And actually, I didn't see that. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that is statistics is so fundamental. And uh, it has been used across nearly all um, areas. So it is so fundamental that uh, um, we just, uh, people just use it and uh, develop their own applications for engineering work. Uh, there's no specific statistical engineering department, but the idea of science and engineering, that is pretty much the difference between um, statistics and data science. So uh, in data science, people are actually trying to solve specific problem, utilize the principles we have already studied in statistics and a few other areas, um, as well as most recently, uh, we have a much larger data set with the revolution of big data, as well as the software industry. All those makes uh, possible for data science. Uh, in summary, the data science is the engineering aspect. Uh, the data science is trying to solve specific problem, utilize whatever uh, theoretical background uh, in statistics, um, machine learning, computer science, um, but um, the main difference is uh, the application aspect. It's very interesting, we do have a uh, statistical engineering uh, concept. Um, it is uh, actually in the ASQs of um, American uh, Society of Quality. Um, uh, so uh, if you are interested in, that's actually from application point of view, how statistics and the engineering uh, mindset to solve a um, quality problems. What's the difference between statistics and data science? And it is very easy to uh, summarize the uh, comparison between a statistician and a data scientist. Uh, for stat statistician, we are more uh, uh, relatively focused on modeling, that is the science piece. For data engineering, is primarily focused on the business problem. And uh, that's the engineering aspect. Uh, the end result is gonna be um, a application. For statistician, we usually bring more, uh, data to the model. Uh, a typical uh, scenario is uh, we find out a great model. Let's try to find a few data sets to see its application. From a data scientist uh, is the other way around. There is already a business problem and then there is already a pretty huge data set. Uh, let's actually find a few models to, uh, uh, to feed uh, uh, the data and to see which one is going to work and which one is going to give us the best result. For statistician, data is relatively small in size and uh, clean in format. 
like CSV file and the Excel file. Those are the common uh, files statistician uh, is dealing with. Uh, on the other hand, for data scientists, um, the data is uh, much more complicated and oftentimes is um, pretty large and also it's messy and uh, uh, it's also both uh, structured and unstructured data. Um, statistician usually isolated from the production system. The production system is something that the uh, software backend uh, the system is running on. Um, well, data scientists are usually embedded in the production system such that the model developed by data scientists can be implemented in the production system to automatically create value. While model developed by the statisticians usually is a standalone uh, and um, uh, there are extra work, uh, extra help from software developers to implement any model uh, to the production environment. So after we kind of compare the difference between data science and the statistics and the data scientist and the statistician, uh, we can actually um, go into the skill set um, that is uh, required for a data scientist. So we always, uh, I think many of uh, you have already uh, see this kind of like three pillars of skill set. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, for a good data scientist, the modeling knowledge is very important. Uh, there are statistical learning, machine learning, deep learning, and also uh, to implement uh, the model, uh, the, the, the modeling background into a particular uh, problem. So as a statistician, we're all good at that. Um, the other aspect is business domain knowledge and the statistical thinking uh, to abstract the business problem into uh, machine learning problems. Uh, if you have been working on consulting works for a little while, and uh, you are very familiar with that. So um, in, my, in my opinion, uh, statisticians are really good at the two aspects of the three pillars. And the third one, um, is uh, uh, the uh, production system knowledge and the programming skill for implementation. Um, in uh, tech companies especially, uh, uh, the model has to be implemented in the production environment uh, to, cre to create value. Uh, so the production system knowledge and the uh, production level programming skill, um, like uh, Java and big data pipelines is, uh, something that um, a typical statistician is not good at it. So uh, that's the most uh, difficult part for a uh, statistician to develop, uh, to learn. Um, so, but uh, luckily, um, the cloud environment uh, actually makes the third pillar, the bar, lower and lower. So now, uh, statisticians are actually uh, more statisticians become a excellent data scientist uh, because of the cloud environment um, uh, uh, developed in the past few years. Um, so to illustrate the cloud, um, the benefit of the cloud environment, uh, I'm going to uh, start with my personal story on computing resources uh, around 20 years ago. <clears throat> so around 20 years ago, working on computation physics uh, project. Uh, it is pretty much using linear algebras. Uh, so the LAPEC library is the, um, um, the widely used the linear algebra library. Uh, it's going to do like matrix uh, operations, eigenvalues, and those kind of uh, typical linear algebra um, uh, stuff. And the problem is uh, the size of the matrices in the computation uh, were very large. And uh, there are many, uh, there are quite a few matrices getting involved and each of them can be huge in size. So suddenly the size of the matrix is beyond the memory of the computer at that time. So whenever that happens, the typical uh, programming language at that time, I was still using uh, Fortran because uh, that is computational um, 
in computational, the Fortran 90, Fortran 2000, that's the newer, newer version of Fortran is still um, uh, widely used at that time. Uh, so the solution is uh, because we could not have all the data into the memory in a one single computer, uh, so the solution is uh, from a hardware point of view, we can have a cluster of computers uh, with multiple nodes. Each node it has a CPU, memory, and hard disk. Um, and also we need a fast connection uh, among them. Um, so uh, so we, we can actually save part of the uh, matrix uh, into different um, uh, computation nodes. So uh, from a user point of view, we are going to have a much larger uh, memory and much more powerful uh, CPUs uh, for the problem at hand. But of course, once you distribute the data, the programming become much more difficult. Uh, from a software point of view, uh, at that time, there indeed a scale LaPack as a distributed version of LaPack uh, is, is going to deal with the matrix actually one single matrix, uh, the data was divided and put distributed uh, at the different um, uh, computation node. Um, so it sounds all good, uh, but uh, the problem is it took a few months to get a working cluster. Um, and writing the distributed uh, code for distributed memory was pretty hard. And uh, uh, why it took a few months? I remember when, uh, once uh, uh, the, um, the, the lab got approval uh, for a budget to buy a uh, new computer cluster, and uh, I have to uh, contact a few different kinds of vendors to get their code and finally choose one of the vendors. And then uh, the vendor is going to prepare and shape uh, the uh, cluster uh, to the university. And then um, our uh, administrator is going to install softwares to make sure uh, it is up and ready. So it is e easily uh, it easily took a few months uh, before you have the budget to a working computation uh, computer cluster is up and running that uh, uh, you can use. Uh, so that's twenty years ago, but not anymore. Um, the five uh, major aspects of computing, like storage, computation, different algorithm, and connections, and integration with other uh, platform, all those um, actually are um, uh, solved by uh, going from local to the cloud. So the cloud platform is well-maintained, scalable computing solution that can meet the needs from a uh, single course project, uh, like for example, for for this talk, I'm going to have a mini hands-on session. So um, uh, I'm going to use the cloud uh, computing to do that. And it can also, uh, uh, the cloud environment is also good uh, uh, to operate a major company. Like for example, Netflix um, does not have its own data center and uh, uh, it is using uh, AWS as the backend to run um, the entire business. The cloud system is professionally managed uh, by thousands of software developers, and it will have the most uh, safe and secure environment than uh, your uh, homemade, uh, homemade I mean that your own organization maintained uh, cluster, because you may only have a, a handful uh, software developers to maintain the whole system. Um, and also uh, for data scientists, one of the biggest uh, uh, advantage is the cloud environment. It solved the most uh, diffi difficult part uh, for statistician, the big data pipeline, the product environment, and model implementation. Those um, had the bar of uh, uh, doing all those tasks has been greatly reduced with uh, the cloud um, uh, environments. So uh, that makes uh, more statisticians to be a, a great data scientist uh, to uh, develop and implement models. Um, now we can get a scalable uh, computing cluster in just a few minutes in the cloud. Once you have the budget get approved, uh, you can get a, a working cluster and it's scalable uh, in just a few minutes. 
So for the cloud environment, there are um, a few different um, uh, vendors. And for um, beginners, uh, like Databrick uh, is a good uh, uh, solution. It has a web-based notebook environment uh, that uses actually either AWS or either backend, but uh, it, it offer a free community condition. So it created small computing um, resources for you, um, but it's always free. Uh, so that's a that's a good starting point to um, to uh, to learn um, uh, the cloud environment uh, using Databrick. Mm -hmm. um, I do have uh, a kind of like a one day training course I usually uh, do uh, using Databricks. Uh, so if you are interested, I can actually share. Uh, the link of the uh, one day training uh, is, is much more expanded version than what we're going to cover today. Uh, it is all online. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, I can share the link. Um, at the end of this um, <clears throat> uh, presentation, I'm going to do a quick demo on the uh, AWS SageMaker, uh, basically to, to show, uh, uh, to create a production level R model and uh, also uh, create a, a um, uh, endpoint to host the uh, the model we created, such that software developers can uh, actually refer to that uh, endpoint uh, to integrate that model to the rest of the production environment. So uh, this is uh, uh, we're going to uh, go in more detail, but this is the uh, um, uh, the key components of the demo we're going to do uh, at the end. Uh, to make sure uh, we have enough time. So this demo can, can be longer or shorter, so that's what I want to put into the end. So for data science-related uh, career, we already have these uh, three skills, and uh, there are actually not one uh, career path, but there are multiple, um, what I call a data science-related um, uh, career paths, and uh, um, especially in large companies, the um, uh, job family actually is defined uh, very clear for different directions. But for smaller companies and startup companies, uh, they may actually only have uh, two or three different category, or even one. So that one person is, is going to take care of everything. Um, from a statistics education background, um, this is what I uh, uh, what I put for <clears throat> different career title and what the relevant education is actually uh, <coughs> um, uh, is about. So this solid line I put in here is more like a um, uh, uh, preferred, and dashed line is potentially possible, but. Uh, uh, may not be a good match. So um, uh, the business, all those career titles are the actual career titles in Amazon. Different company may have different kind of uh, titles here, but those are the uh, uh, different um, uh, titles for different positions within Amazon. So um, uh, it's actually not necessarily to be uh, always a PhD in statistics. For PhD in statistics, I think the two um, career paths that is uh, matched, a, a good match is research scientist and applied scientist. Well, for data scientist, uh, it's actually the master in statistics is a better fit. Um, and also, uh, even for uh, bachelors uh, in statistics and uh, it, uh, uh, the, with the background and the candidate can, can be a good candidate for business analyst and business intelligence engineer. And the good thing is um, uh, if you are good at uh, uh, the three different skill, uh, skill sets, if you're, if you're good at all three, then you become like a full stack data scientist. That, that is actually, uh, you can do a combination of those careers, uh, 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 career, career titles. Uh, which is basically a startup companies really prefer uh, because um, they do not need uh, to have multiple people to work on this area. And if uh, someone is good at all three skills and then um, uh, 
he or she can be a uh, taking care of all of those data science related um, uh, areas. Uh, in in large corporations, each career path actually has its own uh, 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 its own promotion cycles. So business analyst can be a principal business analyst. Um, so um, that's actually different focus. For data scientists, there's also a uh, distinction between generalist and specialist. Generalist is um, majority of the statistician uh, will, will be, um, be doing is a generalist data scientist. Uh, is trying to, uh, the idea is trying to solve business problems and it requires a pretty strong business problem formulation skill, data pre-processing and statistical and machine learning methods and some deep learning applications and um, um, the whole model building uh, process. For specialists, it, it, is, it is called specialist because um, the primary day-to-day -day work um, specific to a particular task. For example, like an LP or image or voice or translation. So those are very specific area. Um, so uh, um, for specialists, usually um, uh, it's going to uh, require a, a PhD in a very matched uh, domain uh, to be um, to be you know a, a, a to be considered in that um, um, direction. So uh, now let's um, come to the um, project cycle. Project cycle um, it is something um, uh, it's not usually covered in um, in a typical conference. Um, or talks, um, but hopefully uh, my own experience as, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, lessons that I learned from other uh, data scientists in the projects is gonna help uh, you to understand the end-to-end -end cycle for uh, a data science project. The overall cycle is, is basically covered from the concept to a product. There are a lot of things in between, and uh, we will break down uh, each uh, each part of the cycle. Let's start it with modeling. Um, for statistician, we are really good at that part. That's the model exploring and model development. Uh, what is the training, validation, testing, and how to choose the best model from model selection? Uh, those are all the modeling aspects. And uh, also, in, it is uh, the focal point for many presentations and trainings, uh, just to get a good um, a modeling aspect. But model alone is just a part of the whole uh, cycle of the project. Uh, before any model can be, can be fit, um, we need to consider about um, um, the data quality, uh, availability, the data pre-processing and feature engineering, and more importantly, the data science formulation and how can we actually convert the business problem into a set of uh, analytical solutions. So that's before we can feed any models. Uh, but even before that, it is the uh, business problem definition and, and uh, understanding and what it is we're trying to solve. And uh, in most cases, it's not clear um, if we are going to solve it and how much impact it's going to be. That's the quantifying business value and uh, define key metrics. Uh, those are very important at the beginning of the project. And the computation resource assessment, uh, how much computation power we're, we are going to use, even though the cloud environment is going to be very easy to expand, uh, but we need to quantify and how much um, uh, we need and how much budget we have. Um, for a particular data science project, we need to set up timeline key milestone. Otherwise, it's uh, very easily to go uh, uh, overdue and um, will not uh, meet the, the milestone. 
uh, and more recently, like the data security, privacy, and legal related aspect become very important. So what kind of data we can use, what kind of data we cannot use, what kind of model we can use, what kind of model we cannot use in a particular project and become a very important aspect. Uh, so those are the, um, as a, the first, the, those are the very first step uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, for a data science project. But modeling is not the end. Even after the model has been developed, um, it is just a halfway. So uh, after the modeling, it's going to be, um, uh, this is actually focused on model. It's not a standalone model, but the not model has to be uh, implemented uh, into the production environment. Production environment, uh, one example is, um, uh, suppose Netflix is going to, a, is going to have a uh, movie recommendation model. Uh, so every time a user logs in and uh, based on whatever features uh, the algorithm is going to provide a, um, a recommendation, a best match for the next movie or, or shows. Uh, so it's a production environment. So the model has to be embedded into the production environment and run every time a, a user logged in. Uh, so uh, before the model can be put into the product environment, we have to do a experiment. So the experiment is also called A-B testing. It is one of the simple design experiments to show that model actually indeed uh, provided better performance with, than without model, or a new model is better than the old model. So uh, that is the ultimate testing. Uh, no matter how good your model are uh, in the training and the and, and testing um, uh, phase, uh, they cannot replace the uh, A-B testing in the production system uh, because that is the ultimate test. And, and uh, the next step is uh, model deployment in the production environment. Uh, once the model is deployed and we need to have uh, like a performance monitoring, uh, at the end of the day, the machine learning model is going to degradate. So it's, 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 a, uh, uh, it's a question of when. Um, uh, we are very sure the machine learning model is going to be degradating. So we, we can constantly monitoring the performance uh, to make sure uh, uh, we, we need to do something about it. That the following up is either to be a model tuning or retraining. Uh, or maybe model update to add on new features, or we can declare the model is no longer working and we have to fundamentally change the model and we call, we, will, we have to have a model failure and retirement plan as well. So once we have all those um, aspects put into uh, working, then that is the um, uh, uh, cycle for a, uh, a data science project. So planning, formulation, modeling, production, post-production. And for statistician, I believe we are really good at uh, the modeling piece uh, and some exposure on the formulation and the planning phase. But for the production, post-production phase, uh, uh, if you haven't been working on any of those uh, um, production level models, and those probably uh, seems like uh, a relatively new concept. I see there are some questions in the um, uh, in the chat let me see uh, it's fine it's nothing important uh, so we can cover that after you talk okay sure yes. um, so uh, because there are so many steps there are so many uh, collaborations uh, to finish a data science project um, so so many team get involved so uh, the cross team collaboration is very important uh, aspect to, uh, for a successful data scientist. Uh, so those are the uh, uh, teams we have, been, uh, we have to work on and um, not only business team, but uh, technology team, but also uh, like um, project management, program management and all those uh, um, uh, collaborations. Uh, we have to have a big picture uh, to understand the a particular data science project 
as well as uh, other projects going on at the same time. Um, so uh, there's also a difference between different kind of models. Um, one of the typical model a statistician is really good at it is what, what I call a offline model. So all the data is actually saved um, in a particular format or somewhere. Uh, and uh, once the, those data will be used for model development, once the model is developed and we're actually applying uh, that model to another offline uh, saved data set, that's offline data, offline model. Uh, but actually, it, it, it is not always uh, like that. So there's also online data, excuse me, online data. Online data is something the data is actually created in real time. Um, so a model actually can use the online real time data uh, to make a uh, model output, to make decisions. Uh, that's like, for example, whenever a customer log in to Netflix or a customer log in to uh, Amazon and then there is a recommendation model for a new product, a new movie, and these are real-time model because uh, it, it happens as a, in real time. Um, and there are also, uh, one of the typical model data scientists develop is use offline data to train the model and then now we're gonna make the feature available in real time. Then we're gonna apply that um, uh, model developed using offline data to the uh, online real-time data to make um, uh, real-time decisions. This is one of the typical way for uh, um, typical models. There's also a offline only model and model trained based on the online data. So we're not, we're not gonna go to more details there. Um, we are, let me check the time, there's nine. 12.37. Uh, 37, so we're gonna finish at uh, uh, one o'clock, right? Yes. Okay, so um, um, we still have some time, but I need to uh, get a little bit faster. So the common pitfalls for data science project, because there are so many different stages uh, in data science um, project, and then um, there are some common pitfalls, and hopefully, after this session, you will um, you will act, you will be aware of those pitfalls, and in your next data science project, in, you can proactively identify and avoid those pro, um, pitfalls. The first one is in the project planning stage. Uh, there are actually pitfalls like solving the wrong problem, um, which sounds silly, but it ha happen all the time because the data science projects is usually uh, for business problem that is weakly de uh, defined and then there, there's no clear definition of the, the end goal at the beginning. So there could be misalignment across many teams. And the more importantly, sometimes the scientist or the science team are not actively uh, involved in the beginning of the problem for business formulation. So uh, it is easy to get um, the project actually solved the wrong problem. And too optimistic about the timeline. That is another uh, um, big problem in data science project. Uh, very few data science scientists, uh, data science project uh, will finish ahead of time and with less budget. It's always the other way around. Uh, it's run over time and over budget. Um, the reason for that is people are too optimi optimistic about the timeline. Uh, the product managers may not have the past experience. And um, there are many machine learning uh, or data science specific uh, uncertainties uh, during, the, um, uh, during the whole project that are not accounted for. Um, it, it's, just, it's just different from um, other projects. And over promise on business value, uh, that is also a typical one. Um, uh, so there are usually some unrealistic high expectations and uh, many, many of those assumptions to have this high, uh, unrealistic high expectation is, uh, is, is usually not true. And um, uh, so that's the uh, product planning stage. 
also on the formulation stage, um, there could be too optimistic about standard statistical and the machine learning method, uh, uh, too optimistic about data availability and quality. Um, this is especially painful because uh, usually there are a huge amount of data. Uh, people is going to take it for granted um, and then say, oh, you already have so much data, so it should be good enough or should be enough. Uh, but usually big data is not a guarantee of good and relevant data. Uh, big is usually means big and messy. And the ideal data for the business problem is almost always not available. Um, so in majority, in majority of the case, what we have is historically happened data set and it may not uh, be the ideal data for the problem. Um, there, there could be also too optimistic about um, the needed effort for data pre-processing and feature engineering. Um, so if you have already done a few projects, uh, you, you may aware that uh, maybe more than 80% of the time a data scientist's day-to-day -day work is dealing with data-related tasks. So try to find out the right, right data source and data pre-processing, drawing a few tables, and feature engineering. Uh, at the modeling stage, we're more familiar. Um, there could be uh, unrepresentative data uh, we have, or um, too optimistic about the model selection and hyperparameter tuning, and overfitting, and uh, obsession for complicated models. Um, Complicated models may be good uh, performance for the training data set, uh, but for testing data set and when it is applied to real situation, it may not perform as well as, uh, as the training uh, process. So um, overfeeding and it sometimes is a big problem. And uh, take too long to fail. It, it, it may be uh, we need to fail the project earlier um, uh, to actually rethink what, what can be done instead of uh, actually keep trying uh, on, on the same on, on the same uh, same aspect. In the production stage, um, bad production performance and fail to scale in real time applications. Those are the, the typical ones. Bad production pro performance. Uh, there are different kind of um, reasons. There could be um, uh, the production environment uh, is fundamentally different from the process. You get the training data, and uh, uh, sometimes there's even no uh, shadow mode. Shadow mode is basically let the model run a little while in the production environment to see any any uh, special things happens. Uh, A-B testing is to make sure uh, the model performs well in the production system before we actually fully implement the model. In the post-production stage, uh, there could be no necessary checkup, no model monitoring, and uh, no exception uh, notification management, and um, uh, uh, or uh, uh, even if the model failed and there's no way people can figure it out. Uh, the production performance degradation, that, that, is, that is true for any machine learning models. Uh, so uh, we have to have a way to kind of like a trigger the performance degradation threshold and do something about it, either through a model fine tuning or retraining or adding new features. So those are some of those um, uh, common pitfalls we see in data science project. Uh, soft skill, it is something, um, if you have already done a few consulting work uh, projects, you are probably already very familiar. Uh, so uh, as a study student, we have a strong modeling background and we know the model assumptions and we know the, how to interpret the result. So uh, uh, we, we should lead um, with our ex uh, expertise. Um, uh, but two, good, to, to be better communicate with um, uh, not only 
other statisticians or data scientists, we have to interact with multiple teams across uh, the entire project cycle. Um, so uh, one of the most important one is try to understand and uh, speak the same language um, with um, uh, other team members. Like for example, um, those, those terminologies are actually referring to the same, uh, uh, but uh, people from different backgrounds will call it differently, like label, target, outcome, uh, class, response, dependent variable. So all those different people say different kind of terminology, they are all referring to why the model, uh, features, attributes, independent variables, predictors, co-varies, and th those are the X in, in, in the model. Um, so there are some other things like weights, it's the same as parameters, learning is exactly the same as fitting, and generalization is all applying to the population or testing data set. Uh, so based on the historical reason, different uh, um, people have different uh, uh, terminology for the same thing. And we, we at least need to be aware and of those difference and then speak um, the same language uh, with them. Um, th this is a fun piece, the communication, the different style between uh, uh, people work in statistics area and, and people working in computer science or data science. <clears throat> in statistics, we have all kinds of errors, um, type one error, type two error, mean square error. But uh, in computer science and data science, people are usually talking about accuracy and precision. Um, the same thing, but uh, just different uh, terminology. And in statistics, we have like a dummy variable, lack of feed and loss function. Uh, in data science and computer science, uh, people are using one hot encoding and uh, uh, faithfulness information gain. And, and it, it is not one-to-one -one mapping from the left to the right, uh, but we can see the pattern. Um, so in statistics, we turn to use like a negative terminology um, in computer science and data science, uh, people usually use more positive terminology. Um, that's kind of like a presentation communication skill. I'm not saying we should sugarcoating anything, um, but um, sometimes just a way of um, interact with other two members may give people uh, different uh, uh, impressions of uh, uh, statistician and um, uh, data scientist. Um, so, uh, it's just a decision we usually have uh, the impression to other people. It's, uh, statisticians is like a um, gatekeeper and we're trying, we're always saying no, uh, not enough sample, uh, not enough uh, uh, accuracy or not, not enough, um, uh, or the assumption is not, uh, the assumption is not meet. So uh, those are, uh, uh, th those are right uh, uh, um, conclusions, but uh, only saying no uh, is actually not enough uh, because at the end of the day, we have to solve the problem. Uh, even though the assumption is not valid, uh, what else can we do? Can we uh, try another method? Can we um, you know, uh, try to make sure uh, the assumption is at least partially valid? So saying no, it's not enough, and we have to provide alternative solutions. Otherwise, whenever we say no, and there's no follow-up or no alternative, it is done. It, there's no more uh, communication. Uh, so uh, from an engineering aspect, we have to solve the problem, and uh, we have to do something about it. Uh, we have to uh, think very creatively to find an alternative way to solve it. If the first uh, proposal is not going to work. Um, so then I think um, we're almost run out of time. So uh, I'm going to skip the rest. And then there is a fun video. Uh, if you have time, you can actually watch it. Uh, it's the experts. It, it is very, um, uh, if you have been working in a 
uh, industry uh, for a little while, you probably will be aware that it happens all the time. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, let's let's go through the demo uh, for a little bit, and then we can answer a few questions. <clears throat> The demo I'm going to go today is um, is actually a SageMaker R model that uh, we actually put into the production. Uh, due to we do not have enough time, I already run this uh, this uh, notebook. This is a notebook. Uh, this is in, uh, SageMaker. Basically, is a uh, AWS service uh, that provides machine learning. Um, training and uh, automatically create an endpoint once the model is trained. Uh, so this mo notebook instance is basically where we do we coordinate all the task. So I already um, uh, in this particular case I already uh, trained the model. So what we are going to do is uh, um, figure out the endpoint is created. So this is the um, greeting boost model. Uh, this is the endpoint that I created based on the model. Um, now, um, so th this is basically uh, the how to create a model. This is in R. So we read in the data, uh, we do the um, uh, initial uh, <coughs> feature uh, data pre-processing, and then we, we create a uh, model based on the training data. And once the model is trained, we actually do the deployment. So uh, this is how, the, how we uh, deploy the model. Uh, once the model is deployed, it's become a you know uh, it's, it's served in a in a host. Uh, we can uh, what we can do is going to be uh, calling that model uh, from uh, other applications. Once the model is trained, we can call it in R or from Python or from Java. So that's the uh, fundamental uh, difference. Is once the model is in a endpoint. So software developers actually can invoke that endpoint anywhere they want. Um, even though it is developed using R, but it can be called in any other language. So this is actually from Python. Uh, we're going to run that. Um, so this is try to uh, this is what we're trying to do is the endpoint is already created by uh, calling this, um, by running this notebook, a particular model endpoint is created and uh, the endpoint can be managed and uh, through this uh, SageMaker environment. So this is basically the endpoint we created. So it is being hosted in a, in a server. So um, anyone who, have the access to this endpoint actually can, can write, can invoke and write. To write, basically, uh, we create a input data and then uh, we load the endpoint and then we do this predict uh, using the input data. So uh, it's more like a black box uh, from, um, uh, uh, from other uh, person's point of view. So a software developer, uh, can actually uh, in integrate it, uh, can integrate it, the um, uh, endpoint in the production environment, uh, such that uh, the uh, model implementation is no longer a barrier uh, for statistician uh, to be worried about, uh, because uh, the uh, SageMaker provided a efficient way, uh, once the model has been trained, uh, we can uh, just simply call uh, the uh, simply call this um, uh, deploy function uh, such that it's going to be automatically 
uh, put into uh, the production environment and create a uh, identifier for this um, uh, model. And then anyone can call this model from any programs, and any applications they want. So uh, this is the R model, but I caught it uh, from a uh, Python. So it works just fine. I just need to give it input and it will give, a, uh, give me output. So I think that's um, all I'd like to show today. Uh, we only have around four minutes, but uh, 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 I can answer a few questions if you have. Okay, thank you very much, Ming. Thank you, great talk, uh, very uh, informative. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, so now we can actually uh, um, answer questions. Um, we can go like a 10 minutes over the uh, one o'clock dot. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll read the question that have been posted here mm -hmm. so far. Um, so the first question is by Susan Simmons. What are the best practices in identifying when a model should be retuned? <coughs> uh, usually, um, there there are there could be um, two different kind of uh, triggers for retraining model. One is time based. So if we uh, have some experience, uh, we need to retrain the model every quarter or uh, tune the model every quarter, then we can have these um, uh, time-based uh, tuning or retraining schedule. Uh, the other way is a uh, event triggered. So we usually have the model performance monitoring. If the performance is actually a lower than a degradating and lower than a certain threshold, uh, what we can do is to trigger the model tuning or retraining. So the model tuning and retraining could be uh, uh, manually or semi-automatically or fully automatically, uh, depending on how, uh, how we want this tuning and retraining uh, to be done. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Zara. As a new gradu graduate, I have no experience in post-modeling stage. Should that keep me from applying for data scientist positions? And what would you suggest practicing those skills? It's a, uh, it's a good question. For anyone who, who is actually recently gradu graduated from school and probably uh, you did not have this kind of end-to-end -end, uh, uh, experience uh, there. Um, but um, uh, my suggestion is, um, uh, for data science, uh, for data scientist related positions, there are more towards applications. So if you can uh, do a few, uh, uh, one or two, a couple of uh, projects from the beginning to the end, uh, those projects can be a Keiko competition, for example. There are many uh, finished and uh, ongoing Keiko competitions. Those are real problem. The data is provided by different uh, organizations. And uh, also there are uh, teams competing for that. And also at the end of the day for finished uh, competitions, there are also um, what other teams that has already done. That's a good learning uh, experience. And um, uh, it definitely is not uh, going to uh, keep you from applying data scientist position. Um, but um, uh, once you have a couple project experience, uh, you probably is gonna have um, uh, some idea and uh, about uh, the uh, post modeling stage. And, and also for the post modeling stage, um, you can apply that same idea to the, uh, the, to the uh, uh, project you're doing right now. For example, you may, you may have some new data comes in and um, you, can, you can look at it whether uh, there are any trend uh, to what kind of things you, you should monitoring and uh, uh, you know, uh, if you detect something and then what you, you, you need to do. So maybe first from a manual point of view uh, without uh, uh, automatic solution and, and manually if there is a degradation. First of all, what is the threshold you would like to 
set uh, to trigger a you know a manual retraining, uh, and then um, then how you're going to kind of create a new data set to train it. Uh, because in most applications, data scientist project, uh, data science related project is about a business problem. And business problem is also very dynamic. So whatever happens uh, uh, last month, uh, last quarter or last year, may or may not related to what is gonna happen uh, next week, uh, next month. So that there, there's some, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, at the end of the day, it looks like a time series um, uh, con uh, con concept when we need to be aware there's change in the dynamic and then uh, what is the best uh, best uh, uh, time period that I need to have the training data. So those are the open questions. And um, I think once you think about that and uh, did a couple of uh, projects, uh, it, the experience you get from those will be good enough uh, for, for, the, um, uh, for, for the positions, especially for the first positions after school. Great. Thank you. The next question is from Ginger. I love that you I love that you are addressing this topic, in particular the pitfalls. In your opinion or experience, what type of roles within organizations has the power to change some of the fundamental assumptions that ultimately cause those pitfalls? Is there an organization that you you feel has done a good job of organizing itself, such that the likelihood of the pitfalls surrounding data science are minimized? It's a long yeah, question. that's a that's a, a great question. Um, so uh, it it's, it it really depends. Um, I, I think. Uh, uh, for data-driven companies, it is much easier to um, it is much easier to uh, to kind of avoid those pitfalls um, because uh, if a company or the culture is going to be let the data and model to speak itself, then uh, uh, it will be easier for a data scientist to communicate with all levels of, uh, in the organization to make sure um, those pitfalls will be proactively identified and avoid. Um, so, uh, but sometimes making uh, failures is fine. It's, we have to actually learn from it and uh, to try to find out uh, 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 better solutions after that. So uh, for those pitfalls, sometimes uh, uh, for a new organization, it, 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 it might be the fact that uh, they're after a few tries and then and, and, and failed, and then there will be more uh, willingly to, to, uh, uh, to avoid those pitfalls. Uh, but in my opinions, uh, for any company uh, who actually have the um, data-driven decisions and there is a uh, very good measurement of uh, metrics, uh, very well defined matrix for any of the pro data science project. And then it's a little bit easy to communicate because once the matrix, uh, the business matrix is set, it is clearly we can see whether the model is gonna work or not, whether the data is good or not. Okay, okay. thank you. The next Questions also from Ginger. Do you have a link or page where we can study the code you had in the demo for integrating a model in software elsewhere? Uh, yes, uh, that, 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 um, <clears throat> this one, this um, notebook uh, is actually a example uh, in SageMaker. So, uh, so basically, um, if you are not familiar with SageMaker, it's um, it's very easy uh, to get start. So it's basically a notebook um, environment. Uh, so typically, uh, once you have a AWS account, then you can have this um, SageMaker service, 
and uh, you can uh, service to look for uh, SageMaker, um, which is build, train, and deploy machine learning models. And then it is going to give you this interface. So um, uh, you can actually create a, uh, a notebook. That's the notebook instance. Um, this is the notebook instance. Once you have the notebook instance created, uh, you can always um, uh, create a notebook. Um, so the, the R code that I'm showing is actually from the SageMaker examples. So it created a ton of different kind of examples to get uh, uh, to help people to get started. So uh, majority of them are in Python, uh, but uh, there are a few R related um, uh, notebooks. Uh, so uh, they're put in different category. Uh, let me see R examples. So if you go to the R example um, uh, section, there are a few um, notebooks that actually uh, show you kind of one step at a time to how to create uh, a, if you open one of those, it's going to be like that. Uh, it's going to show you how to create, uh, what the steps to create a model and deploy the model. Uh, so uh, if you are familiar with Python and there's much more and R is supported uh, 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 through uh, SageMaker, but there are more examples in, in Python. Uh, so uh, it also has some deep learning application as well. So uh, there, there are basically a ton of different examples uh, in the SageMaker example uh, uh, tab and it actually provided a very good starting point uh, if you, your application has a very similar uh, SageMaker example notebooks, then you can actually leverage the uh, notebook as the starting point to, uh, for your own training. Yeah, so it's, it's all there, yeah. Okay, great. Um, next question, we have uh, three more questions. Um, so we're gonna uh, finish at uh, like 1.10, so three more questions. Um, the next question is uh, from Deepa. What would be your suggestion if someone wants to enter into data science job to get real-time experience? Um, that for, for the um, uh, real-time experience, uh, if uh, for students, and then I will highly suggest to do a, a couple of uh, capstone projects uh, with your uh, uh, classmates. And that's actually usually a capstone project, usually from uh, a company, they provide the problem data. And another one is a Keiko competition. It is, um, uh, it is, real business problem is also data provided is a competition um, uh, competition environment uh, let me uh, <coughs> look at what is the Kiko competition that is up and running now uh, so as you can see um, uh, there are so many um, uh, those are active competitions they all provided the business problem they all provided data set. So uh, all sort of different uh, problems. And then I, I will suggest uh, they're also uh, completed. For completed one, uh, you, can, you can actually um, look at it, what others, what the others teams that has already done. Uh, so that, that, that's, a, um, that's a good, um, uh, good way to get the exposure of real-time uh, experience. Good. Okay. Um, we have two more questions. Um, uh, the next one is from Manor. When I look at jobs, I often come across data analyst. What is the difference between data analyst and uh, data scientist? The difference between data analyst and data scientist is um, very similar to the um, um, uh, to the job that I, I showed here. Uh, <clears throat> data analyst is, uh, 
is is same as is very similar to the business analyst. So um, uh, it has less requirement in uh, modeling, um, but it require a better maybe business insight. Uh, so business analyst is probably is not going to use too much um, R or Python, and 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 um, uh, for data analyst maybe SQL and and uh, Excel related uh, uh, tasks. So. Uh, um, so it, it also depends on the uh, job description. So different companies will have different uh, <clears throat> uh, titles for the same uh, job family, but uh, usually business analysts and, and data analyst is uh, more focused on the data and business aspect, but less focused on the modeling aspect. Okay, on uh, the last question uh, from Tiffany, I'm currently enrolled in the data boot camp at UNC, and I have experience with Python 3 and the pandas with Jupyter Notebook. Is this enough to gain a position as a data scientist? I have a, a master's degree in math and graduate certification in applied statistics and data management. I have 19 years of teaching experience. I'm trying to transition out of education. Um, <clears throat> so uh, now the, for data scientists, more and more uh, companies, they do require to have uh, uh, Python or R uh, experience, and if you have Python experience, that's 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 better uh, because even from the SageMaker example, we can see there are more examples uh, in Python than R. Uh, so Python, that is good. You already have the Python exposure. Uh, Pandas is uh, primarily for data pre-processing -process, uh, and uh, uh, feature engineering, and usually. Uh, people, uh, the candidate is re required to have some modeling background as well. Like for example, we can leverage Scikit-Learn um, uh, to uh, uh, Scikit-Learn to do uh, modeling. And uh, more recently, um, because of the development of uh, deep learning, some data scientist positions require uh, deep learning uh, related um, uh, uh, knowledge and the skill, but not all. So it really depends on the, the job description. And um, um, let me uh, here. Um, let me um, share this uh, this homepage. I'm, I'm going to post this link into our chat window. So uh, you can save that uh, address. Uh, this is basically one of the uh, one day training workshop uh, I and my uh, co instructor created. Uh, we use that as the uh, 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 one day workshop for ASA traveling course. Uh, so uh, it actually covered um, uh, some of the content that I, I, I presented today, but it has much more uh, content including uh, like the big data platform, um, the tree-based models, as well as deep learning related concepts. So uh, if uh, you are interested in, you can definitely actually um, uh, look at the, uh, the slides, as well as the uh, notebooks. All those hands-on sessions is actually in um, uh, Databricks Community Edition is always free. And uh, so that's why we use that. Um, so for both R and Python code, so um, so so basically um, that if you are interested in to learn a little bit more about other uh, 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 aspects of data science, that, that's some some uh, good starting point. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, I mean, for this very uh, informative, valuable talk and citing from some of our audience.
And uh, I think that, oh, also one more thing. Someone was asking if we can get the slides from you. Uh, yes, and, Amy, I, I already sent you a version. You can actually send it out to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, okay. uh, to the participant. Okay. And uh, also for those who came in late, uh, this talk is being recorded and will be posted on NCASA YouTube channel. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Ming, and to, uh, for giving this talk and thank you everybody for attending this webinar. We hope to see you at another of our NCASA events. Thank you, bye-bye, have a good um, weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.